I uh, began our time today by quoting to you from the Bible. I quote to you from the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, where it says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Again, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And we saw that in our last study here from the pit to the palace, we saw where a guy by the name of Joseph, Joseph, because he continued to trust the Lord, he continued to do right, and the Lord rewarded him because of that. Now, things were tough in Joseph's life. Things was hard in Joseph's life. But because he continued to trust the Lord, hmm, he continued to do right. And therefore, again, the Lord rewarded him. Some of you might recall from the last study where as Pharaoh, who was the king of Egypt, the most powerful nation at the time. Pharaoh noticed, Pharaoh saw how that the Lord God Almighty was with Joseph. He saw how that the Lord had given Joseph knowledge and wisdom. See, what happened was this. God had given Pharaoh two dreams which Pharaoh did not understand. But then the word came down that Joseph could interpret dreams. So the Lord gave Joseph the answer to those dreams. And the answer was this. He told him this. He said, for the next 14 years, this is what's going to happen. This is how things are going to go down. There's going to be seven years of abundance. Seven years of abundance. But at the end of that seven years, there's going to be seven years of famine. And he says that the famine is going to be so strong, the famine is going to be so severe that nobody's even going to remember the seven years of abundance. And guess what? It went down exactly like the Lord said it was going to go down. Because something that we need to know is this. If God said it, he's going to do it. If God said it, he's going to do it. Jesus put it like this, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one word of mine is ever going to fail. And so everything went down exactly like the Lord said that it was going to happen. So at the, at the end of the seven years, again, the famine, I mean, the, uh, seven years of abundance, the seven years of famine came, and the famine was so strong. The famine was so devastated that people from everywhere came to buy food in Egypt because that was the only place that there was any type of grain. People were coming from everywhere. As the people were coming, so did Joseph's brothers. The same guys who had took him and sold him into slavery, they too came down to Egypt to buy some grain. And this is where we pick up our study at. Let's begin reading right there in Genesis chapter 42. We pick up right there in verse 1, and it says, When Jacob, who's Joseph's father, learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard that there was grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. The ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain. For there was a famine in the land of Canaan also. Now, Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold the grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. 
Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my Lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the sons of one man. The servants, your servants, brother, are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your younger brother, and the rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. For if you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go back, while the rest of you go and take back grain for your starving household. But you must bring your youngest brothers to me so that your words may be verified that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. Verse 21. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now, we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Stop right there, if you will. Let me have your attention. Because, again, there's a lot of things that's going on here. There's a lot of things, again, that happen, that's happening in this passage of Scripture that pertains to our lives. I always tell you and I always remind you that everything that's written in the Scriptures is written for our benefit. And so if you read in the Bible, you have to ask yourself these questions. What does this mean to me? How does this fit my world? So if you don't ask yourself those questions, you're going to be reading and you might have a remembrance of what it says, but you won't be able to uh, get anything personally for yourself. So there's a lot of things that's going on in here that we need to see, that we need to understand. First thing that I want to remind you of, and this is something that we talked about in our last study, and that is for 13 years, God has been working on Joseph. For 13 years, the Lord God Almighty has been making Joseph into a servant leader. Notice that. A servant leader. He wasn't just making Joseph into a leader. He was making him into a servant leader. He was making him into a servant leader with a heart of compassion. See, because that's how the Lord himself operates. He operates from a heart of compassion. So for 13 years, he's been shaping Joseph. He's been making Joseph. He's been working in the heart of Joseph. Again, making him not just a leader, but a servant leader. And here's why that's so important. Because that's what God wants to do with you. He wants to make you a leader. Be it a leader in your home. Be it a leader at your school. Be it a leader on your job. Be it a leader here in the church. God wants to make you a leader, but he doesn't just want you to be a leader. He wants you to be a servant leader with a heart of compassion. A servant leader with a heart of compassion. Because again, that's how the Lord himself works. And so Joseph... Because God had given him a heart of compassion. When he saw his brothers, instead of striking out against them with violence, 
he wept over them with tears. Instead of striking out against them with violence, he wept over them with tears. Yes, it says here in a couple of places that Joseph spoke harshly to them. Now, even though he spoke harshly to them, that does not mean he was out to get them. See, because you have to understand this. If he wanted them to be got, it would have been over. Understand, he is the ruler in the land. Nobody's higher than Joseph except for Pharaoh. So if he wanted them to be got, all he had to say was, get them. Take them, put them to death. And nobody would have questioned anything that he said. The reason why he spoke harsh to them was this. He's testing them. He's testing them. He's testing them to see if they've changed. He's testing them to see if they are the same hard, cruel, callous guys that he dealt with before. Or have their hearts been changed? And see, and understand something. There's nothing like tough times. There's nothing like tribulations to test your heart. Amen? There's nothing like tough times. There's nothing like tribulation to test your heart. Because when everything is smooth, when everything is going good, it's easy to say what we're going to do. Amen? Ever been in a situation where you said, oh, man, you saw somebody make a move, or you saw somebody say something, and you said to yourself, oh, man, I would never say that. I never do that. Oh, no. It's easy to say what you will do and what you will not do when you're sitting on the mountaintop. Amen? But when you get down in the valley and you're walking through the valley of shadow of death, there we go. It's a whole different story. There's a lot of people who end up doing things and saying things that they said to themselves, oh, I would never do that. I would never say that. And again, we see examples of this in the Bible. Some of you know the, the story. Jesus told the disciples, all of you are going to fall away because of me. But Big Pete, Pete, who was the leader of the pack, said this, and you find this in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 33. Pete says, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. And if you know the story, Peter and all the rest of them fell away. In fact, Peter not only fell away, Peter denied he even knew the Lord at all with cursing. I mean, this dude, I don't know the man. So the very things that he said that he would never do, he ended up doing. Because again, there's nothing like trials. There's nothing like tribulations. There's nothing like hard times to test your heart. And so Joseph is testing the hearts of his brothers. Have these guys changed? Have they changed? Or are they the same hateful, vengeful guys? that they were before. Now, again, I want you to see something. I want you to know something, and that is that in what we just read here, we also see the sovereign hand of the Lord. It was the sovereign hand of the Lord who brought Joseph's brothers to him at this particular time. What you need to know, what we need to understand is this. Joseph's brothers coming before him was not an accident. It was not a coincidence. It was not luck. No, this was the sovereign hand of the Lord moving. What we have to know, we have to understand is this. Again, Joseph is the number two man in the land. And so there's no way that Joseph is overseeing Every piece of grain that's being sold. No, this guy is again the number two man in the land. Also know, also understand that there were silos of grain in different cities. So there's no way that Joseph can be in all of these places covering every transaction of grain that was being sold. No, this was the sovereign hand of the Lord bringing Joseph 
together with his brothers at this particular time. In last week's study, I believe it was the last week's study, where we talked about how that we saw the hand of the Lord maneuvering Joseph, getting his man in the right place at the right time. So it's the same thing we're seeing here. Now, it has been about 40 years, 40 years since Joseph has seen his brothers. Now, he sees them and he recognizes them, but they don't recognize him because the last time they saw him, he was 17 years old. He was 17 years old. Now here he is. He's in his 40s. He's dressed like Egyptian. He is speaking Egyptian. So they think he is an Egyptian. They don't have a clue that this is their brother. And guess what? And the same thing happens to you and I. Sometimes we're out somewhere and people see us and people know us and we don't even know they see us and know us. Amen? Ever got a phone call? Oh, I saw you at the mall. You did. Where was you? Don't worry about where I was. I was there. Uh Uh-huh. I saw you. I saw you. (laughs) A few years back, me and my family, we were up at uh, at Disney. And we waited in one of those God-forsaken long lines in the heat. Right? And we're standing there and we're just waiting. And I hear somebody, hey, Pastor Daryl. I'm like, who knew me up here? And I turned around, and it was a guy that I knew from Calvary Chapel in Fort Lauderdale years before. And I'm just going, wow, I'm glad I was behaving myself. See, people see you when you don't even know they see you. And so as God's representation, we have to watch what we do. Amen? And so again, Joseph tests his brother to see the conditions of their hearts. Now, the first thing that we see, the first thing that we know from this passage of Scripture about the uh, condition of the hearts of Joseph's brothers is this. They're full of guilt. They're full of guilt. And we know that because when Joseph said what he said to them about being spies, When Joseph took them and put them on lockdown, the first thing they said to themselves was this, surely we are being punished because of what we did to our brother. We saw the anguish on his face and heard the pleas of his cry, but we would not listen. Now we must give an account. See, what they knew is what most of us already know, and that is that you reap what you sow. Amen? You reap what you sow. Or as they said it back in my day, what goes around comes around. What goes around comes around. And when it comes around, it comes back later, but it also comes back greater. And so his brothers, they knew it. We're in this mess. We're caught up in this thing here because of what we did to our brothers. Now, when Joseph saw his brothers in anguish, he began to weep. And again, that's because God had given him a heart of compassion. See, Joseph now is, he's ready to operate in the gifting, in the calling. And on the platform that God wanted him to operate on. As I said before, God was not just trying to make Joseph a leader. He was trying to make him a servant leader with a heart of compassion. Because once again, that's how the Lord himself operates. I love the fact that I shared this with you a couple of weeks ago. I'm reading through the scriptures. I'm reading through the book of Matthew. And I'm seeing how again the Lord opened the eyes of the blind. I'm seeing how the Lord cured leprosy. I'm seeing how the Lord, again, spoke to the winds and the waves. I'm seeing how the Lord cast out demons. And I'm like, wow, look at all of this power. Look at all of this strength. But the thing that got me was over and over and over again, it says, and he looked at the people, and he had a heart of compassion. So I don't know what that does for you, but that means a lot to me. 
See, because I don't always get it right. See, maybe y'all got this thing on lock. Maybe y'all, y'all perfect. But I don't always say the right thing. I don't always do the right thing. And it's good to know that when the Lord looks at me, he looks at me with a heart of compassion. I love the scripture where it says, the Lord does not treat us as our sins deserve. But as an earthly father has compassion on the son whom he loves, so he has compassion on us. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. See, because I've, I've sinned, I've, I've messed up. I'm already feeling bad. I don't need nobody else to beat me up. Have you ever read that scripture where it says that if you see your brother or sister in a fault, you who are spiritual, go and restore them in the spirit of meekness? Because that's how God does if you messed up, if you've blown it, you already feel bad enough. You don't need nobody else coming along beside you and beat you up with that. You need somebody to help lift that weight up. Amen? And so, again, we see that the Lord has worked on the heart of Joseph because, again, instead of him striking out against his brother with violence, hmm, he's moved to tears with compassion. Kind of like Jesus himself. Many of you know the story. How that when Jesus was nailed to the cross, the first thing he said from the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Also kind of like uh, Stephen. Stephen was the first guy in the New Testament who was put to death because of his faith. Stephen said this, and you find this in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 7. In verse 60, Stephen said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. See, here's the thing. When you can weep with compassion over the anguish or over the pain of somebody who has wronged you, then you know that God has moved marvelously in your heart. When you can weep, again, over the pain, over the anguish of somebody who has wronged you, when that is a sure sign that God has done something great in your heart, that's a sure sign that you are growing in the faith. See, a lot of times people think that growing in the faith means that, man, I know more scriptures. Oh, I can quote this now. I can quote that now. I can actually quote the whole book. That doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. How are you operating in your day-to-day life? And so, again, when there's somebody who has harmed you, when there's somebody who has mistreated you, and you can honestly pray for them, not just let the fact go that you're going to seek revenge, But when you can really honestly pray for them, that is a sure sign that God has done something great in your heart. And guess what? God wants to do something great today in all of our hearts. See, because there are people who are sitting here right now who has pain and anguish in their heart because of a hurt that was done to them years ago. Maybe you were a child. Maybe you were in elementary school. Maybe, again, you were on the job. Somebody said something to you. Somebody did something to you. Somebody hurt you. And, man, you're still carrying that thing. That thing is weighing you down. That thing is killing you. I want you to know something. The Lord wants to release you this day. The Lord wants to free you from that thing this day. That thing has ruled over you for far too long. The Lord says, today is your day of liberation. But this is what you have to do. You have to begin to, first of all, pray and ask the Lord, Lord, release me. I want to be set free. Now, if you say that in all honesty to the Lord, that you want to be set free, This is what he's going to say to you. He's going to say, pray for them who despitefully use you. Pray for them. And you're going to pray for them, God. God. And God says, yes, pray for them. And 
Now, I don't mean pray for their disaster. I don't mean pray like some of those prayers in the Old Testament, especially in the, in the Psalms, where you see David praying about his enemies. And David said, Lord, knock their teeth out. Lord, pull out their beards. Make their children fatherless. No, he said, pray for them. Pray for their well-being. You see, when you can begin to pray for their well-being, that's counterproductive to the work of the flesh. Now you're operating in the spirit. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, through the pulling down of the stronghold. You're pulling down that stronghold that the enemy has had over your life. But you have to be willing. God, pray for them. He's not saying go and be their BFF. He's not saying be their best friend. He's not saying that you have to let that person back into your life in the same place that they were. He says, but for your own sake, for your own sanity, for your growth in the Lord, pray for those who spitefully use you. And I'm telling you, when you do it, you'll see the Lord release you more and more and more. You'll find your own freedom. Look with me, if you, if you will, at what it says there in verse 25. Excuse me, verse 25, it says, Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to put each man's silver back in his sack and to give them provision for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys and left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other trembling and said, What is this that God has done to us? When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. They said, the man who was Lord over the land spoke harshly to us and treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, we are honest men. We are not spies. We were 12 brothers, sons of one father. One is no more, and the youngest is now with our father in Canaan. Then the man who was Lord over the land said to us, this is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me and take food to your starving households and go. But bring your youngest brother to me so I will know that you are not spies but honest men. Then I will give your brother back to you and you can trade in the land. As they were emptying their sacks, there in each man's sack was his pouch of silver. When they and their father saw the money pouches, they were frightened. Their father Jacob said to them, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. And now you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. Then Reuben said to his father, you may put both of my sons to death. If I do not bring him back to you, entrust him to my care and I will bring him back. But Jacob said, my son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm comes to him on your journey you are taking, you will bring my gray hair down to the grave in sorrow. Stop right there. What we're looking at here is a test. This is a test for everybody. Remember, the Lord God had given Joseph knowledge and wisdom. He, give, he gave him a spirit of wisdom and a mind of understanding. And so Joseph has devised a test for everybody. First of all, this is a test for his brothers. This is a test for his brothers. Is he, right, are the brothers, brother, are they going to sacrifice another brother, right, like they did Joseph for their own safety, or are they going to go back and get Simeon? 
This is also a test for Jacob himself, the dad. Is the dad going to take another favorite son and put him over the rest of the sons? This is a test. This is also a test. Is will, will they, will Jacob and the brothers ever realize that Joseph is alive and that he is the Lord over the land? Questions, questions. Boys and girls, the clock say our time is up. And so you're going to have to tune in next week at the same time, the same station, to the answers for these perplexing questions. As we continue the drama of from the pit to the palace. But let me give you some key takeaways from today's study. Key takeaway number one, which is that God rules over the affairs of men, that he works all things after the counsel of his will. God works, well, God rules, rather, over the affairs of men. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. Number two. There is nothing like pain and suffering to test and to show the human heart. There is nothing like pain and suffering to test and to show the human heart. And number three, for the sake of our own sanity and well-being, we must let go of past hurts and our right to revenge for the sake of our own sanity and well-being. We must let go of past hurts and our right to revenge. And this week's challenge is this, not to strike back when struck. Not to strike back when struck. Also, guys, I want you to pray that God would just give you a heart of compassion. Ask God, give me a heart of compassion. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your power. Give me a heart of compassion. And here's the thing that we must understand. You can only be filled to the capacity in which you're willing to be emptied. You have a lot of people saying, God, Fill me with love. Fill me with your joy. Fill me with your peace. Fill me with your compassion. And God says, I want to. I'm willing. Because God says, if we ask for any good thing, if we ask for anything according to his will, it shall be done. So if you're asking the Lord to fill you with love, if you're asking the Lord to fill you with joy, if you're asking the Lord to fill you with peace, if you're asking the Lord to fill you with compassion, God says, yes. But again, you can only be filled to the capacity until which you're willing to be empty. So God says, yeah, I want to fill you, but you're so full of self. You're still holding on to that hurt. You're still holding on to that revenge. You're still holding on to that bad attitude. God says again, I want to do something great. I want to do something marvelous in your life. And so, guys, please, I pray again that you would pray that prayer with sincerity because God will do that. Again, I thank you guys for coming out and joining us today. Thank you guys for tuning in on Facebook and on YouTube. Again, if, if today's study or today's service has been a blessing to you, please pray for us. Pray for us. See, we know we can't do what we desire to do by ourselves. We need the Spirit of God, and we need the power of God. And when we all pray together that God, again, would use us to the capacity that he wants to use us, and we're willing to die to ourselves, 
great things can take place. So pray for us. Pray for us. 